Hello, my name is Jeremiah McCall, and I teach high school history at the Cincinnati Country Day School. Um, I'm a Greco-Roman historian by training and still write on, on Roman topics, um, but I'm also really fascinated in how to use interactive media and what the effect of interactive media are in history classes for teaching, for learning, and, and even for the presentation of history. Um, to that end, I wrote the book Gaming the Past about six years ago as a guide for teachers uh, who wanted to learn more about using historical video games in their classrooms. Um, more recently, I've been working on Twine, experimenting with it, with, with it in the classroom, um, speaking on it, uh, reading and writing, um, trying to figure out how Twine can be an effective tool, not only for students who want to develop interactive histories in their classes, um, but also for expert historians who want to craft compelling arguments with the tool. That's what I'd like to talk about with you today. If you happen to be watching this during the value workshop, I'll look forward to a question and answer session with you at the end of the video. First, I'd like you to consider this proposal, All History Educates. Um, if we consider, as the historian Greg Denning did, that history is simply the contemporary representation or interpretation of the past through a medium, right? It's that transformation into a medium. Then there are all manners of histories and all sorts of media available. Books, articles and speeches, statues, paintings, toys, and, and of course, video games. Of course, there are examples of more sound and less sound history in all these genres. But what unites them all is the imaginative aspect. Works of history require their makers to imagine and reimagine what the past was like, metaphorically or literally. What was it like, why things happened, how people lived, and so on. Of course these histories are interpretations. There's no perfect history, no perfectly accurate imagining of the past. I'm not really sure what that would look like, but no matter, they don't exist. And because all history offers a message, that message being the reimaginings of the history's creator, it all has potential to educate. At its core, education, right, is the fostering of new knowledge or understanding, affect or skills of a person. A historical monograph that changes someone's thinking is educating, at least as I understand it, and it's not just the, uh, the, the purview of the classroom teacher. A picture or toy or game that leaves someone with a different understanding educates. Of course, this is not to say that all education is helpful, affected, or grounded in sound historical principles. Um, that, that's a different matter altogether. But at any rate, consider this. If all history reimagines, and all history has the potential to educate, and there's a spectrum, not a sharp divide between academic and amateur history, a medium like twine that is effective for education may equally be useful for academic discourse. With that in mind, let's consider video games and then interactive texts as media for doing history. So let's start with historical video games as a medium before we get specifically into interactive texts. Historical video games can be thought of as simulating the past in a couple of ways, um, as Adam Chapman, Chapman outlined in his book, Digital Historical Games. Some are realist simulations. They focus on visual verisimilitude, creating virtual environments that the player can navigate, environments that ostensibly look like those in the past. Others are conceptual simulations. They focus not on a specific, detailed, authentic, and visual navigable world. Instead, they rely on more abstract symbols and underlying rules. Procedural rhetoric, as Bogost, Ian Bogost called it maybe 10 years ago, to tell players how the past was. Whether realist or conceptual, historical games present the past in the form of historical excuse me, historical problem spaces, a concept I developed in a pair of articles in 2012. Historical problem space consists of an agent with one or more roles and goals within an environment, a geography. There are elements in that environment that can afford certain actions and opportunities to the player, serve as constraints on player action, or some combination. The agents then in this space form strategies and make choices, trying to work with and around the elements to reach their goals. Since different media shape their messages differently, it's worthwhile to consider some differences between video games and static text as distinct media for doing history. I pick static text because that's the medium most commonly thought of as the default for history. Some would even argue it's the proper medium, though I wouldn't be one of them. Video games as a medium are characterized by their variability. 
They're interactive, allowing players to make meaningful decisions. There are varied outcomes in the game as a result of allowing players to make those meaningful decisions. Video games also form closed dynamic systems except for a player input. The elements must connect together into a greater working system or the game simply will not be playable. Text, on the other hand, is precise and linear. The strongest examples of that are mathematical formulas. This is no small advantage. It does not offer the reader any meaningful choices, however, and text is also not a closed dynamic system. If the author chooses to ignore dealing with some aspect of the past, the text can still be readable as a whole and purposeful. Designing a historical video game certainly qualifies as doing history, as historying, a term Chapman borrowed from Greg Denning and I borrowed from Chapman. But designing a historical video game as, for lack of a better term, designing it as a serious history poses significant challenges to the history student and historian. First, visual media pose challenges for designers of history. Any frame of visuals has a great number of details in it, and all of these can be critiqued by a viewer or a player for their accuracy. Geography, flora, fauna, clothing, equipment, architecture, hair and skin color, the list goes on. This can be an awful lot of material to account for, and it gets muddy for the student or the academic historian when the goal is to produce a historical work <clears throat> and to determine which details can be sacrificed or misrepresented, if any can. Then there are the skill requirements. Even though game design tools have gotten much more simple and powerful, they still require a fairer mill to use effectively. That requires time and energy that academics and students may need to spend elsewhere, in research, for example. Um, so it's a challenge for academic historians and history students to design video games as works of history. And unsurprisingly, examples of such work are, are pretty scarce. Of course, game designer historians do, do this all the time. They do historying through their video games, but then they have a different ranking of goals generally than your academic or student historian. Uh, entertainment, appeal, and engagement tend to come before authoritative historical interpretation. So, designing vi historical video games, while certainly an act of histori uh, historying, presents a real challenge to student and academic designers. So now that I've talked about the medium of video games for doing history and some of the challenges of making historical video games from an academic or a student uh, standpoint, I'd like to move into interactive text. At least at this point in time, interactive texts are a much more promising medium um, for people that want to, again, represent history as academics or students. Uh, and of course, this would then hold true for archaeologists and really anyone who's trying to represent the real world in an interactive medium. Um, it's worth considering a few things about interactive text before we dive into this subject. First, interactive text is most commonly referred to as interactive fiction on the web. Um, I avoid this term in order to emphasize that what historians of any type would create is, is not meant to be fictional. If you want to dig deeper into this medium and its history, though, be aware that you'll run into the term interactive fiction quite a lot. That being said, there are two basic kinds of interactive texts. The first is parser-based, represented on the left. The player reads the text that describes the environment they're in and then has a command prompt. Um, at that command prompt, the player must guess some combination of relevant verbs and nouns to proceed. Go north, take the letter, read the letter, and so on. Then, assuming that the, uh, the program understands the command, the new text is displayed indicating the effects of the player's actions. Uh, Inform7 is the most popular design tool for creating parser-based interactive fiction today, uh, and it's a great tool if you're trying to do that sort of work. The second type of interactive text is choice-based, and Twine, which we're working on in this workshop, is choice-based. In these types of texts, um, the player reads a description of their current circumstances and has a series of specific listed choices to choose from. Generally speaking, the player does not have to guess what actions are available, as they would in parser-based text, since those choices are listed in front of them. Clicking on one of the choices displays new text, updating the player's situation in light of the choice made. Twine is the most popular and, I would argue, best tool for creating a choice-based interactive text. There are distinctions between parser-based and choice-based interactive texts that can be important when considering how to use them for history. Parser-based uh, texts are system-based from the ground up. There are built-in uh, systems and models for inventory, for character navigation, things like that. Some coding is required, although it's mostly very accessible. 
Verb guessing is at the core of parser-based interactive text. And so exploration and environment, finding the right commands to get things to move forward. And so the best uses of parser-based systems are those where you are trying to have freer movement and exploration, navigation, something like that. Or more interactive mechanics where you have a sense of issuing orders and seeing how things respond. Parser-based might be really good for that. Choice-based texts, like Twine, on the other hand, are not inherently system-based. They're passages with links. No coding is required at the basic level, though coding can be added. Most importantly, actions are obvious in choice-based texts. They're listed in front of you. You select the one that you want. You don't have to guess what the actions could be. And so the best uses are broader. Virtually any historical situation involving agents that are weighing choices and making decisions. We're going to focus on Twine and uh, choice-based text at this point. But whether it's a choice-based text or a parser-based text, um, what you find with these interactive texts is a combination of game and text. You're gaming the text. You get the precision and the clarity and the focus of text, and, and even the ability to exclude areas of your, of your historical treatment that you don't want to, treat, uh, to uh, deal with. Um, but you get those abilities, plus you get the interactivity, the choice-making, the, the dynamic uh, elements of the game. Um, and so uh, interactive text can be a really great medium for creating all sorts of histories uh, at, at all levels. It's important to remember that student and amateur history and expert history all fall along a spectrum. There's no sharp and clear divide between these, certainly none that, that I've found. Um, with this in mind, consider what a historian of any kind on the spectrum must bring to the table to design an interactive historical tale. They've got to be able to research and analyze evidence. They've got to be able to synthesize it, put it into context, put it together in a whole. They have to discriminate between the critical and the trivial, right? You're designing a, an interactive text. Everything can't be in it. What's going to be left out? In short, you're doing history effectively. Um, when the student makes a twine, therefore, they're, they're practicing critical thinking skills and critical skills of the historian. This makes the exercise valid just by itself. But there's more to it. The product they're creating tends to be more engaging than the average essay. And, and by this, the simple test of this, right, is that I have ne I never, I don't think I've ever seen anybody take a paper they wrote for me in my class and share it with a fellow student who was just interested in reading it. And I've certainly never seen somebody outside the class say, hey, I'd really like to see your paper you wrote for history class. Share it with me. I have seen people share their twines outside the class with other people because there's some, some engagement level there, some value in the interactivity. I'm sure that that's an important component of it. In addition, it's also worth noting that language skills, reading and writing, can be developed this way. Um, and that's definitely a plus for teachers at all age levels, right? You're using a medium that to be effectively requires students to write well. Um, and, and that can be very useful as well. To move to the other side of the spectrum, an expert can use the skills they have attained already in doing history with Twine. In doing so, they'll create a text that's arguably engaging too, perhaps even more engaging to many non-experts, so, though not all, of course. But experts will also get the benefit of using a medium that highlights the role of agent choices, which is important to many kinds of histories. Not all histories, but to many kinds. While there's not time to really go into the details here, it's really important that I, I stop for a moment and note that student twine projects can be terrific for the reasons I noted on the slide before. Um, I do have resources for this, rubrics I've tried out, and uh, specifications on gamingthepast.net, but please email me if I can be of any help, or you can follow me on Twitter and I talk about these things. The basic steps, though, are research um, and think in terms of a character in a situation and research the choices they have and the effects of their actions. Plan it out first and then outline it in twine, but in cases in uh, steps two and three, make sure that you think first about what the actual choices are going to be and how those branch. Don't fill in the text until you've got that basic structure, because otherwise you're going to spend a lot of time with dead ends not working out effectively um, the choice system. After you filled it in the text, play test it some, then share it with peers because that's really where some of the payback comes for designing um, is this sense of getting to share something that you value with your peers. And finally, revise and then share again. They should get the chance to revise these projects to make them as great as they possibly can be. 
So let's consider the characteristics of Twine histories um, using Twine as a medium and some of the design issues and historical issues raised by using this medium. Please note here, I'm confident this is only my view and, and one could approach Twine in equally valid but different ways. So I suggest these are characteristics of the Twine medium. This is my impression based on working with Twine and playing a number of choice-based interactive fiction texts in order to experience it. At its heart, Twine is about reading text and then clicking to go to other texts. So there's a lot of variety here and it's not that every Twine has to be formed this way. But choice-based text as a medium seems to have some certain ramifications for design. There are two basic forms of agent-based Twine history and then a third that's not quite that that I'll speak about. Every person and specific agent. Every person twines are given where there are authentic circumstances but a fictional agent, the protagonist of the game, never lived. Um, this is what the approach is for historical fiction. You know, don't make the protagonist a well-documented historical figure because their actions would be dictated too much by the historical record. Select an every person instead in the same historical context so you can have some flexibility. Essentially, all player agent actions in these are counterfactual because the specific agent were uh, lived. But the key to having a sound history uh, uh, in this approach is to situate the player in evidence-based, historically authentic circumstances for that person and place and period. My Path of Honor's work and Rachel Ponce's Surviving History of the Fever are examples of this. On the other hand, you have specific agent, agent uh, twine-based histories. Here you would have a historically documentable agent in historically documentable circumstances, a specific person who existed. There are often historical and counterfactual strands. One can choose to act historically and experience historical results, but making choices the historical agent not actually make lead to counterfactual results. And therefore, there's a greater degree of counterfactual tension. As soon as the first counterfactual choice is made, a world of speculation opens up. Um, examples of this include Neville Morley's Might and Right, the Athenian version. And I have included links to these on my website. The third approach, the plus one, I call the experimenting deity approach. It's not agent-based. It's based on the idea that you could have the player be an outside-of-the-world actor, a god like in the Civilization series, making decisions about what happens to the people that they are standing outside of. To my knowledge, there's not example of, an example of a historical-based twine that does this. But Max Kreminsky's Epitaph game points to what one might look like, and I encourage you to check it out. Whichever of the agent-based approaches one selects, Twine is fundamentally geared towards choice making. Um, there's an environment or a scenario description accompanied with one or more link choices. I mean, it's called choice-based interactive text for a reason. So exploring an agent's motivations, decisions, and the consequences of those decisions is a natural fit for Twine. The history created with these becomes counterfactual by necessity. In the every person approach, essentially every action is counterfactual in the sense that the specific agent never existed. But of course, a good history of this sort will have authentically possible choices. In the specific agent approach, granting choice at all requires counterfactual possibilities. To take the opposite, if one could only do what the specific agent actually did, there's no meaningful choice to speak of. Either way, the player of a historical twine will make choices and experience varied and not entirely predictable outcomes. With this comes a potentially engaging sense of curiosity, anticipation, and exploration. Uh, and it's also worth emphasizing, it may be a very good way to model choice in history, um, something that, uh, that gives it a reason to exist beyond static text. Designing an agent-based historical twine can, can really benefit from a problem space approach. Um, I referred to analyzing video games um, in terms of historical problem spaces earlier. It's, it's a concept I advanced a few years ago. Um, in this context, thinking about the agent as being in a historical problem space can be a helpful way for considering the elements and details that need to be in a historical twine. So there'll be a historical agent and every person or a specific agent that is in a virtual environment, a, a situation they find themselves in. They will make choices based on their goals and their perception of environmental elements and their ability to either capitalize on those elements or mitigate the effects of those elements.
The more systems-based the underlying code of the twine is, the more relevant the problem-based design approach is. But even the design of simple branching text can be clarified by thinking about the agent in a problem space with goals, elements that they need to benefit from or work around, um, and, and a, an environment that they're working in. Now let's think about the extent to which a designer might develop a systems-based twine. There's essentially two types of underlying structure to a choice-based text, with a fair degree of overlap between the two. And here I'm indebted to the fantastic work that Emily Short's done on all matters of interactive text and narrative, her writing, and, and, and the games she's made. Um, the first type, anyways, is the just branching type, you might call it. Um, these are only designed with passage text and links, so there's just text and links like the old choose-your-own-adventure books. There's no world model, no tracked player or world states, no underlying variables, uh, no relationship between variables, obviously, coded into the text. The only world state that exists in these games is expressed by the current passage the player is on. Therefore, as short notes, instead of choices influencing the development of one game world, one whole game world, each choice leads to a distinct new parallel universe, as she calls it, a unique world state. If multiple choices lead back to a single passage in the future, all those choices become irrelevant from that point on in the narrative because there's no keeping track of different states of the game other than the passage one is on. The other type is a twine with an underlying world model. The state of the agent, the world, or both are kept track of with variables in, the, in a model, and that model is updated according to the cho choices the player makes. There is one world, no parallel universes, and the state of the world is determined by the model underneath. Good historical twines could be constructed along either line, but it becomes increasingly important to the organized designer to decide earlier rather than later which approach they will adopt. So now let's look at my project, Path of Honors, um, as an example of, of, of many of these ideas that have been floating in front of you. So my goal with Path of Honors was and, and is to make a serious interactive history, to present a legitimate research-based argument about the political systems and competition between aristocrats in the Roman Republic, and I wanted to represent that as an interactive text. It started as a project to help me better understand twine as my students made their own twine text for history class. But I picked the topic both because it would be useful for my 12th graders in their Roman Republic elective to play, and also because of my interest and relative expertise in the, in the subject matter. Um, of course, in a fit of bad role modeling, I didn't really outline it at all. I jumped into some initial sequence for a young aristocrat climbing the political ladder at Rome. I tried to design elections for the first office on the ladder, and at this point it's probably worth saying that cursus honorum, um, the Latin word, means either path of offices or path of honors, and that's where the name of the game comes from, because there were a series of offices an aristocrat might hold uh, throughout their career in the Republic. Anyways, I tried to design elections for the first office on the ladder first, the edile. But then I qu uh, pretty quickly realized that I would need to go into military service. Every aristocrat was required to perform 10 years of military service before they could hold political office. And so I decided to write about an encounter between a cavalry patrol, a Roman cavalry patrol, and a Gallic cavalry uh, force. Um, because aristocrats coming from the wealthy uh, branch society would serve as cavalry. Cavalry. So, okay, I've got this idea. And quickly, though, this led me into a consideration of choices, right? So you've got your cavalry squad with your player character, and you've got the Gallic cavalry squad. So what choices are there? Fight the Gaul? Not fight the Gaul? Would there just be a random chance of victory or death? If the player won the duel, would that have lasting effects in the game or be lost in the sea of future choices? These were some of the questions I was considering. Going a bit further, I had to decide whether I'd have a stateless game um, or whether there'd be state tracking and a game model underneath developing over time. And pretty quickly what I decided is that the role-playing game model was the best approach. Um, players, stats, the players would have stats expressed as numbers and they would have to make choices that would develop their, their characters over time in response to their actions. And so there'd be a persistent underlying system. This was a good start. Um, so the initial characteristics I decided to model were virtus, um, uh, the sense the Romans had of somebody was courageous militarily, um, and popularity with the voters. 
But I still had to figure out what the challenge was, the choice for the player. Um, I, I could have had them make choices about how to fight the Gaul, but I was worried that this would devolve quickly into a very gamey model of com, uh, combat rather than a historical model of, of choices. So basically what I decided is that the choice had to be whether to fight the Gaul or not. And the only way that could be a meaningful choice is if you had the risk of death. Fighting the Gaul could lead to death, but it could also lead to an increase in Virtus and popularity. And so the principle that started to develop for me is that these choices needed to involve trade-offs in the game in some form of risk management. Taking the risk could bring the rewards, but also bring setbacks, and even end the game. Avoiding the risks kept one safe, but uh, allowed for no increase in any stats. So from there, I basically created a model where each of the 10 years of cavalry service required, one decided whether to take risks or not take risks. And then I was able to extend this to other things in terms of uh, oratory, for example. Another thing young aristocrats did is argue law cases. And so I created a system here where, again, they could choose to take a case or not take a case. But here there was a little bit of a twist. They had an oratory skill. This was a new thing I had added. And the oratory skill gives you a chance to do a certain, be, be effective at certain kinds of cases. So you basically are gambling, do you have strong enough oratory skill to, able, to be able to handle the random case that's been put in front of you? And so a more nuanced decision making uh, is involved. So after going through this set of design decisions um, for cavalry combat and then for oratory, I decided to commit fully to this model. Um, so it became pretty clear that however I went in the game, I wanted the character to have a set of stats of different kinds recorded in variables, and that over time these would change based on the player's choices. So there would be an underlying world model, and the effects of players' decisions would continue on in the game world throughout the whole game. Now I've got three sets of stats, and I should say most of them are not implemented at this point, but I've, I've created them in the code so that I know later on when I get to a certain situation in the future, I'll say, okay, what statistics are relevant for this? So here's the, here's the, uh, the three that I've come up with. Um, basically, we've got skills. And skills are the ability to know and act effectively. So the player's ability at oratory, their knowledge of legal uh, institutions, their ability to follow religious practices, and, and their ability to fight, like martial ability. These would be skills. Then there are rankings, how a character measures up in the core qualities that aristocrats use to compete with each other. Their, their weirtus, their sense of sort of military courage, their dignity their popularity, and the piety that, that people felt that they had. But then on top of that, I wanted to create a set of hidden stats. These the player would never see, and they represented how they're perceived by their society. I came up with four. Uh, one is NVIDIA, or envy, and so this would be the extent to which other players, or, or excuse me, other computer characters uh, were jealous of them, perceived them as enemies, as, as rivals. There's a corruption statistic. To what extent do people perceive them as being corrupt or not? There's a brutality statistic. Compared to, you know, based on Roman norms, which are pretty brutal by our standards, was the character conceived of as more brutal or less brutal um, than, than their peers? And finally, populism. To what extent is the character perceived as being a demagogue, as one that will, will as the Romans would put it, consort with the people to their own advantage rather than favoring the interests of the wealthy landed class. I chose quantifiable statistics um, uh, for my historical model because it seemed to me the best way to capture some basic realities um, about uh, political competition. Um, people have skills, uh, and some people are better at some things than, than others. And while we probably can't actually put on them, you need to put numbers on them for them to work in a computer model. Um, at some point, I may take away the number. I won't take away the numbers, but I may hide them from the player and just have descriptions instead. So instead of having a five weirtus, you might have a weirtus level of very brave or something like that. Um, but what this RPG stats model has allowed me to do is, is to expand over time. I, I now am very confident that I can figure out how all the different offices and things might fit into my model. 
uh, here. And, and, and of course, Path of Honors follows only one of a variety of possible models. This is the specific, a, excuse me, this is the uh, every person approach. Uh, and I decide, decide to have an underlying uh, world model. You could also have an every person approach where it's just branching, or you could have a specific agent with just branching or an underlying world model. Um, but this is the way I decided to go. I guess I'd like to leave you with um, something that I came up with uh, when I was grappling with what choices should players have. Uh, and then I was also working with others. I, I was talking a lot with Neville Morley with his specific agent approach. You know, how do you give players choices and what happens if historically they didn't have many choices? And I've decided to coin a rule. I'm going to call it McCall's Rule of Good Choices in a Historical Game. Um, and uh, feel free to use it or, or, or deny it. Um, the designer must provide situations where there's more than one viable choice, and the historical choice cannot be the only viable choice. What I was trying to get at there is if you're given a cho choice-based game and the historical choice is always the one that's obviously desirable, then that's not going to be a very compelling game. If the players, I mean, it, what a strange situation that is where the historical choice is always the reasonable one, is always the best one. Instead, we have to design games where there's more than one choice and on different assessments of risk and reward, of trade-offs, player might, players might choose one choice over another. But the one that happened historically is not set up as the preferred choice in all cases. Because again, that's not very different from just saying history is predetermined. It had to happen exactly the way it did. Which, maybe that's true, but if you're, in, if you're interested in portraying that kind of history, a choice-based text is probably not for it is fascinating, though, how many questions about counterfactual history uh, arise from developing these twines. And for me, that just becomes excellent grist for, for good conversations with students. But it also is something that, you know, that professional historians can deal with. So hopefully at this point we can add twine to the list of, of uh, media that can capture and can pass on history. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, uh, feel free to contact me. I'm always interested in talking shop and I've put up my uh, contact information there. Uh, check me out on my social media. I do spend a lot of time talking about twine and history and games and history education. Um, go and do some reading. I, I, I've put together a bibliography for you that's uh, on the website where I'll permanently host this video. Um, and then more importantly, particularly today as you're off to explore this new tool, make something, try something out and share it with the rest of us so we can kind of grow and, and, and build our understanding of how choice-based media can be used as a tool for studying the past.